Greetings LEGO fans, I'm excited because today I have for you something straight out of my childhood, the Nintendo Entertainment System. This is kit number 71374, has 2,646 pieces, and this should be more than just a nostalgic set because there's actually some little play features involved. On the side of the TV is a little crank which when you turn it it gives Mario that side-scrolling action that we've come to love in his old systems, and I'm super looking forward to playing with that. So let's get this thing unboxed, have a look what's inside, so we can get this build underway. If you're anything like me, then your excitement over this kit has probably inspired you to do a bunch of research online before buying it. Maybe you've been watching this video as part of that research. And I gotta tell you, that having done this myself, I thought I knew exactly what I was getting in this kit. But, now that I've built it, I can tell you that there's a few more features and nice little details that I didn't see mentioned anywhere else before. The side-scrolling action on the TV has been very well advertised, and the little level 1-2 easter egg has been well documented by a lot of reviewers. But there are a few other surprises in here that I was very happy to discover. Starting with the console, it's been scaled down to roughly three quarters of its original size, and the color, shapes, markings, and ports all throughout have all been recreated beautifully. Comparing it side by side with my original NES, I think you'll agree. Starting over on the left, we've got the red and yellow RCA jacks for the audio and video hookups, 
And back in the day, these were actually the high quality hookups that weren't available on TVs. And just to the left of that, we've got this little mystery notch, which I never knew what it was for. Coming around to the rear of the console, on the far left, first thing we find is the power connector. To the right of that, we've got this little white connector, which was used for connecting your console to a TV with a coaxial cable, which, if you didn't have RCA, was the only way of hooking up your Nintendo. And between these two, there's a tiny little switch, which allowed you to select on a coaxial cable whether the Nintendo would display on channel 3 or 4. And in the center of this back, we have another one of these mystery notches. Swinging around to the right side of the console, the only thing we have is yet another mystery notch. Coming around to the front, the first thing we find on the bottom left is a little power button with a little power indicator light right beside it. The reset button just to the right of that. On the far right, we've got our hookups for our two game controllers. And, of course, it prominently says Nintendo Entertainment System on the little lid that you flip up for inserting your game cartridge, which we'll get to in a minute. But first, we have this little panel that pops off on the left side of the console, which, when you remove it, reveals the end of World 1-2 where Mario can either go in the regular pipe to get over to World 1-3, or hop on over the top to where Mario can warp to World 2-1, 3-1, or 4-1. And now over to the Super Mario Bros. game cartridge, the game which came free with the console. Although it's simple, it has been beautifully recreated. And except for a few surface textures, which you can't really do in LEGO, there's really nothing to complain about here. It even has that little slit on the bottom, which, if you didn't know what you're doing, used to blow into all the time slowly corroding your cartridge and destroying your Nintendo. And just as it was on the original, you can flip open Nintendo's lid, slide in the cartridge, press it down where it clicks into place, and when you're done, click it down again, pops right up, and pull out the cartridge so you're all set for the next game. And now over to the iconic first-gen Nintendo controller. Unlike the console, the controller is actually pretty much to a one-to-one -one ratio with the original. The cord's a little bit shorter, well, actually a lot shorter, but that's fine. And the B and A buttons are a good amount larger. But other than that, I don't think it's possible to make a more accurate replica. And it's also worth noting that the A and B buttons have a little bit of play action for a little extra fun. And now on to the TV, a relic from the past, from back in the day when everything was larger, except for the actual screen. These TVs were large, heavy, consumed a lot of power, put out a lot of heat, and had a really low resolution. But they actually supported a refresh rate that actually rivals some of the best LCD monitors we have today. Just as it has been with everything else in this kit, the attention to detail that Nintendo put into the TV surpasses my expectations. Starting all the way in the far back, we have the fake manufacturer's sticker. Here we can see this TV is manufactured by the manufacturer Low Tech, which I find to be the perfect name for such an outdated product. The model number of the TV is DM71374, which is a direct reference to the LEGO kit number, and the little line just beneath that has all kinds of little specs on the TV itself. Beyond that, my googling hasn't really turned up too much. Every time I look it up, I just get referred back to images of this LEGO TV. If one of you has some more information on what these numbers mean, I would love it if you put it in the comments below. Just to the right of that, we have the video hookups, with again the red and yellow RCA cables, and just beneath that, the coaxial input. And there's a little place on the back of the TV here, where when you want to fold in the antenna, you can just clip it right down. Over on the left side, we find a little crank which we use for scrolling the image on the screen, which I'll show you in just a little bit. And now coming around to the front of the TV, over on the left hand side here, we've got this large textured zone, which would be the speaker. Yes, that singular speaker. There was no surround sound, there wasn't even stereo sound. All you got was mono. Shifting on over to the right side of the screen, we find all the controls. Starting on the bottom, we have three knobs. One for contrast, brightness, and tint. Just above that, we've got the power switch. The UHF VHS button, allowing you to switch which frequencies you want to tune into. The channel selector knob. And the little three colors just above that, which indicated this was a color TV. Something which wasn't standard feature and actually needed to be advertised back in the day. And a very pleasant surprise. The channel selector dial on this TV actually moves, feels, and clicks much like the original did. Now, finally, we have our side scrolling action. By turning the little crank over on the left hand side, we create an endless loop of Mario playing out a portion of World 1-1. Being attached to a clear arm, which is mounted on a loose pivot point, Mario will always fall to the lowest point possible. But as the terrain scrolls past Mario, the clear disc just behind him will slide over all the obstacles, giving the appearance that Mario is running, jumping, and stomping on little Goombas and Troopas as he goes through. For that extra little bit of old school authenticity, there's also a little ratcheting mechanism back here, allowing you to scroll the train forward, but not backwards. Because in the old games, once you passed it, there was no going back. And for the final feature, there's a little panel that you can pop open on the top of the TV. 
Up here, we can see this little colored barcode. And as the train scrolls by, we have a bunch of colored tabs that scroll by as well. This is all to be used with the Mario from the Lego Mario board game. If you have him, you can pop him up here. And as the train scrolls by, it'll read the different colored tabs and produce the sound effects that go along with it. From hitting the star, to smushing the Goomba, hitting the Troopa, punching the bricks, whatever it may be, the sound effects are there for you to enjoy. Not only do I find this captivating to watch, but I also find myself being marveled at the simple yet brilliant mechanisms that run this whole system. I'm also pleased to add that this set has very few stickers, actually only three, which is very few considering how many markings are all over the entire set. So that's just particularly pleasing in my books. I find myself a little reluctant to rate this kit on its bricks because this kit's so awesome, I really can't imagine taking it apart. But if you are someone who can take this apart, you'll find that there's actually a very nice quantity of large, usable, very attractive bricks in here. I think it's quite clear that this set was made to be displayed. Certainly, it has some play value. It's definitely fun to turn a little crank, but it's quite limited in what you could do in that sense. So it's much more for showing off to your friends as they come by. And when they do, this is quite the eye catcher. Not only does it look amazing, but the extra little features, the way the cartridge pops in and out, the scrolling of the TV, of course, these are the extra features that your guests won't be expecting and will truly impress them. My only criticisms for this kit, and I might be nitpicking a little bit, but I find that the hose that they use for the controller wire is actually kind of a sticky material, so it's kind of hard to keep clean. I do kind of wish that there was a second controller or maybe the zapper along this kit. That would have been cool because none of these kits were ever sold with just one controller. And the tube used for the antenna, it comes bent out of the packaging, which is pretty normal, but it's kind of hard to straighten out. So I find this always just looks a tiny bit off. Again, this is just me nitpicking. I truly love this kit. I think it's an absolute fabulous display piece. And if you made it to the end of this review, then you probably want this kit. And I truly hope you get it.